Hello, my name is Bruce Keir. I'm the medical director of NHS England, and today I'm talking to the Muslim Doctors Association, which is a great privilege. It's a privilege for two reasons. Firstly, because of the massive contribution that Muslim doctors have made to healthcare in general over many decades, and secondly, to the more specific contribution they've made to our national health service. You know, it seems to me that the characteristics of a civilized society are firstly how well it looks after its vulnerable members, secondly how vigorously it pursues science, and thirdly how well it treats the arts. And if you go back over a thousand years uh, into the Middle East and the Golden Age of Islam, you will find a society supported by government, pursuing science, pursuing astronomy, mathematics, and the pursuit of excellence. You will find a society that had generalist and specialist hospitals that conducted war drowns, invented medical records which were used for peer review and protection in litigation, that sent specialists out into the community to look after those people who were better treated in the community or who needed to be brought into hospital. You will find hospitals that conducted advanced surgery where antisepsis with alcoholic and mercuric chloride was understood, where people were suspicious of airborne transmission of diseases, particularly smallpox and measles, and where quarantine was introduced to reduce the spread of disease. You will find advanced surgery that was conducted with significant opiate-based analgesia, with silk sutures, and most importantly, with anti antisepsis, uh, particularly alcohol-based and mercuric chloride. You you'll find a society that really valued pharmacy, that elevated it to, the, to a professional status and to a scientific endeavor. You will find a society that really cared for the individual. You'll find that that society funded its healthcare system on a charitable tax so that the delivery of healthcare was free at the point of need and that those people who were admitted into hospital were given money when they were discharged from hospital to ensure that they didn't have to work during their period of convalescence. I find it difficult to imagine a society that was more compassionate and looked after its people who uh, needed care. That was over a thousand years ago. And now I invite you to fast forward to the country in which we work. A country with a long history of invention, a country that invented the thermometer, the microscope, the intraocular lens, the ECG, conducted the first blood transfusion, invented the MRI scanner, the CT scanner. A country with science in a similar fashion to the golden age of Islam is regarded as very important. A society where the pursuit of science has resulted in more Nobel Prize prizes per capita of population for medicine and physiology than any other country in the world. A pursuit of science which has led to our country having the intellectual property for 14 of the world's top 75 drugs and a country which has the second biggest integrated healthcare system in the world associated with four of the world's top six universities. Just think of the opportunity that we have before us today. And yet isn't it striking that so many things got forgotten in the thousand years between the golden age of Islam and the NHS today? We forgot about antisepsis. We forgot about the pulmonary circulation. We forgot that the heart pumped blood around the blood vessels. Um, we forgot about the utility of some aspects of analgesia that were developed. And that makes me wonder why we forget so many things. Indeed, forget, we forgot antisepsis, which was rediscovered by Semmelweis in Vienna uh, over 150 years ago, and find ourselves in the last 10 years having to fight 
outbreaks of MRSA. But we have a fantastic healthcare system of which we can all be proud, something to which we all contribute. But the future of all healthcare systems around the world is going to be determined by, firstly, economics, secondly, by science and technology, thirdly, by a set of public, professional, and political expectations, and finally, by demographics. And I put demographics last because, frankly, if you've got enough money, you can deal with pretty well any demographic change. The major influence for change the numero uno influence will undoubtedly be economics. And of course, if our economy does well, our tax-funded healthcare system will do well. But another major um, influence will be technology. And I invite you just to think about your mobile phone, which now can function as a pulse oximeter, a high fidelity lead one ECG, something that can check the refractive index of your eye, something which is now capable of digitizing your vital signs, sending them into a cloud where they can be analyzed by you or others. And when we combine that with the advent of genomics and pharmacogenetics, um, we see a fantastic major scientific influence on healthcare, which we have the opportunity to influence over the coming years. And I would put it to you that as people start to argue that our tax-funded healthcare system, which is free at the point of delivery, might be reaching its sell-by date, that the advent of genomics, which will allow us to identify and anticipate disease, will mean that our population-based funding system, where the whole population share the risk, the financial and clinical risk for everyone, that our healthcare system is very well placed. It will be difficult for insurance-based systems and private-based systems, where we're able to anticipate those people who are, might have certain types of cancer, other types of diseases, cardiovascular diseases and other others, because costs, either personally or through, an ins or through their insurance, in a way from which our healthcare system will protect members of the public. And we will be able to show a very compassionate and civilized healthcare system in the same way that we saw during the golden era of Islam over a thousand years ago. And I invite you to reflect on that. Thanks very much.